So we're here to talk about the Parisian Demystified, which is the name of Rakaya's uh, new-ish documentary. The idea is to think about who represents France, who's talking for France, um, based on this fantastic documentary. We will have time to show a brief clip at the end, but I encourage all of you to go ahead and watch it afterwards. Um, so there are kind of five, you cite five rules in the documentary, Rakaya, um, about La Parisienne, the Parisian woman. So the five rules are be white, that's the first rule, <laughs> be young and svelte, third, be free as the wind when you go out, which is to say be able-bodied, fourth, uh, be a wise and heterosexual partner, and fifth, be sexy and delicate. So this is the kind of frame of the documentary and the documentary takes us through all of these rules and then kind of undermines them in a ways that we'll discuss. How did you come up with these five rules and what other rules were circulating in your mind? Thank you so much. Thanks uh, to the American Library for having us. I'm really glad to have the conversation about uh, the image of uh, La Parisienne. Um, so I didn't come up with those rules. <laughs> they were made up by some other persons and I happened to discover that they were the ones through, uh, uh, they, 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 were, they were building the lens uh, through uh, people who were seeing the Parisienne. So I realized um, that there were a lot of uh, books that were selling very well abroad about uh, the image of the Parisienne. And I happened to be born and raised in Paris. I've always, my whole life lived in, the, in Paris or in the, in the Parisian region. And I didn't cross any of the boxes that were supposedly uh, making the identity of the Parisienne. So I wanted to make fun of uh, that uh, image that the Parisienne uh, was um, the way the, the, the Parisian was depicted uh, all around the world, and also to include myself in the in the in, in the myth and my and some of the people I know as like uh, Grace, who is who is a part of the documentary, and just to question um, who uh, gets to be a Parisian and how it's possible for us uh, French women, Parisian women, to um, to to be at the center of the idea of the French identity. Thank you. Lindsay and Grace, um, you both feature in the documentary um, kind of throughout. For you, thinking about these five rules, which, which rule or rules for you are the most pernicious? Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me on this panel. Uh, so I, my name is Grace Lee, and in, in Roque Adelo's documentary, I, um, I'm speaking in the first chapter which is be white you have to or uh, you need to be white i don't i don't remember the type uh, soyez blanche right, in french <laughs> voilà. um so i think uh so i i can speak of when i well when i realized that um i was not included in this image of la parisienne that the this this myth it did not does not benefit me people when they think of la parisienne and they see me and they think oh but no, not you, <laughs> right? See, I, I think I think it's something that it, it's it's quite painful when you first come to see. Oh, I really like French women, but you, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know if you're Parisian. You know, it's you don't you don't fit in that in that in that category. Uh, so, but I think the most pernicious, the most harmful is maybe that it's unsaid. These are untold rules. You don't you don't read about them. You don't. No one tells you. You're not a Parisian, you know. You were born somewhere. Or I, I wasn't born here. I was born in this southern part of France, and so I came here. And uh, living here, my postcode is a Parisian postcode or sub suburban postcode. So I am technically a Parisian, but I, I do realize that I, you know, I, I, I don't. Those images don't don't include me. So I think that's that's the pernicious, the harmful way is that you um you you learned you learn about these rules the hard way Lindsay what about you well I think they're all dangerous and that's kind of the point and the message of of the film um as well as that you can you can take and perhaps you particularly identify with one of those rules more than others you know um but really when you combine them they are all reductive and that's harmful not only to to the women who live here who like Grace and Holkaya see themselves completely absent from that narrative, but also 
foreign women who constantly look to, to the Parisian woman as for a sense of direction, for a sense of taste and style, because we've also been told that she is there to serve that purpose for us too. And so everyone gets lost in this story, unless you fit that tiny little set of the population who actually matches the description as told by the stereotypes. So you use the word story, and this is a point that you make in the doc documentary, but who is writing this story? I mean, <laughs> if you want to go really far back, I mean, it's, it's writers, thinkers, philosophers, they've all been part of nurturing this story that started, you know, in the 18th century and depicted women in a certain way. And then it gets translated into painting and translated into film. And then people come in and they see this perpetuated over and over again. And then it's hard to break. And then brands take over and perpetuate it further. So who who tells the story? Well, all the, all the sort of decision makers, all the people on the top who control uh, what people see and what they don't see. And then consumers also, in a way, help to nurture this uh, forward by buying into it. And unfortunately, it's something that's very hard to disconnect from. So you mentioned the history here, and this is really interesting, Rukai, because you choose to include a historian, um, a historian of kind of 19th, 20th century women's rights. Can you tell us about why you choose to give us a historical perspective on this question too? Yes, of course, among the different uh, experts that were on, the, on my documentary, so there was Lindsay, uh, also Alice Pfeiffer, and Emmanuel Rotaillot, who is a historian who wrote the book about uh, the myth of uh, La Parisienne and the history of the build, the building of the of the myth. And she uh, goes back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau and, and La Nouvelle Héloïse, and who, how Jean-Jacques Rousseau was part of uh, um, the, the, the creation of the idea that uh, women in Paris were very, very particular, and they were very different uh, from the, the the women of the of the rest of the of the country, because to me uh, the problem with the Parisian it's also that it erases the the rest of the French women, because when people think about Frenchness, they think about Parisianness, and they don't even think that there are so many other parts uh, of France where there are also women and uh, who are worth being known. So I think it was interesting to to see how uh, that image was built uh, through different um, moments, uh, during different moments in the history, how, for example, uh, the image of the French Republic uh, is embodied by a woman, which her uh, name is Marianne. So Marianne is the French uh, face of a, of a woman that embodies the uh, ideal of the French Republic. So she was inspired by a, a painting of Eugène Delacroix, La Liberté Guidant le Peuple. And that woman is, uh, you know, her bust is in all the, the city halls in the country. And you have Marianne, with that woman who was in the in the city halls and in all those public institutions before French women had the right to vote, which is very interesting, and who was kind of uh, uh, the idea of the French ideal. So she is uh, inspired by many uh, French women, mostly Parisians. So her face is inspired by uh, famous women, uh, actresses mostly like Catherine Deneuve, Brigitte Bardot, Laetitia Casta, uh, mostly always white women. The only non-French woman who inspired Marianne was Ukrainian. It was Ina Shevchenko from the Femen. So it's interesting to see that there has never been any non-white woman who was inspiring the face of Marianne. So that also perpetuates the myth of um, the Parisienne. But at the same time, I also wanted to to have uh, Emmanuel uh, Roteo explain me how the myth have evolved during the 20th century. So she explained me that uh, she explained to me that uh, Josephine Baker was the first, one of the first uh, women in Paris not to be white and to be celebrated as an icon of the of the of the country. So she was part of the of the. Um, evolution of the, the 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 way we were seeing Parisian women, even if today we still uh, see them in a very restrictive way. And to answer to your question about who writes um, the story of uh, the Parisian, I, 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 I would say what writes it, and I, I would say mostly patriarchy, because, because all those uh, criteria have to do with, um, with the aspects of our plastic that uh, makes us insecure because to be white, to be slim, not to age, never to age, uh, to, to, to act in the same way, to be fashionable requires much time. And it's sometimes that you don't spend in, in, in valuable things. 
Thank you. Grace, you, you talk about the history too, you talk about the history in a different way, rather than giving us the history that we see. Um, um, you talk about the colonial history of France and how that's not at all reflected in the built landscape and the kind of daily life of France. Can you talk about that point that you make in the documentary, that of France's colonial history? Yes, um, so I, my, my family uh, is uh, Chinese, ethnic Chinese from Cambodia, and they came to France because, um, uh, well, France had a special um, relationship with uh, countries of ex-Indochina, and that is how my parents came here, uh, because um, they knew French, and they had learned it in school, and they came here because it was easier. And um, and when I went to school, well, I I didn't learn the history of how my parents came. I just saw those pictures, those clips, those TV clips of what they used to call the boat people. Um, and I, I I used to ask myself, Wait, why do they call them the, the boat people? Because my parents flew, uh, and <laughs> it you know it was is really difficult for me to 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 grasp. You know why do we have this fixed image of those people on a boat and um, and so that was a, that, you know, it, it really is something that you, as a kid, you know, and it, it, it's difficult. So, um, and, and then when I, I learned the history of, of, of France, which is, um, you know, a, a discipline that is, uh, that a lot of people work on. I mean, not just one person determines what the kids are going to learn in school, the whole body of people, you know, you know, work on it. And they say, oh, so it's, we work on decolonization. But there, there is no word about how we came to colonize. And mm -hmm. that's really interesting where you put your finger, you know, wh which part of the history you want to focus on. If you, you know, only know that, oh, you know, they, they finally became independent. That's great. <laughs> and you don't, you, you don't ask, you know, how, can, how come they were, they were dependent uh, in the first place? And so, yeah, so I had to, 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 to go for this history on my own. And it's funny that, you know, uh, when we mention uh, France and its and, and its um, how it's uh, portrayed in in history, France is always a woman. It's allegory, you know. If you go to the Museum of National, no, the National uh, Museum of History of um, History of Immigration, which is a uh, the um, uh, La Porte Dorée, so it's the old colon colony museum colonies of, of of France. You see France represented as a woman, uh, and all the continents that France um, colonized or dominated, uh, represented in in goods and merchandise and and the bodies of the people that were uh, either enslaved or you know uh, reduced to um, um, what they call les indigènes in in, in French. So the um, you know the, the the people who who, who belong to these places, and and so this image of France as a woman. Is also present there, is in you know the 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 nurturing mother and uh, but if you step out of that role, then you know it's it's we don't know we don't know that you know out of that box. And and the image is still in the museum. It was not only when it was a museum of colonies, but still today, uh, even if the museum is the museum of uh, immigration, the image is there and unquestioned. It's just there. So if you happen to go to the Musée de la Porte Dorée, the Palais de la Porte Dorée, you can see like the whole, the whole wall with, the, with the, the colonial France celebrating its goods from the colonies. Well, so interesting here is it, what your documentary so brilliantly highlights is how these two narratives intersect. So we have at once the narrative of the French woman, the Parisienne, intersecting with this colonial history and how the two narratives speak to one another and kind of accentuate, exacerbate, I would say, even one another. Another way that you, so you give us the history as a way to kind of reveal um, the question. So, and the other way that you do it is through human stories. And this is something that, Lindsay, you do too in your book, La New Parisienne, The New Parisian, um, which is to say you give us a rule. So the first rule, be white, and then you introduce us to, to grace. So why, for both of you, are you drawn to telling? Because there are many ways, of course, to, to uncover a myth. You could, you could give statistics, although we'll talk about the complicated question of statistics as it relates to ethnicity in France, but you could give a, you could do it many ways. And his history is one way, but why, why are you two drawn to human stories as a way to undermine myths? Well, I think one of the reasons I also chose to have a visual element to the New Parisienne was because to reach people, you need to, you, you need to speak to them on a level that doesn't feel too academic. It can get very 
Uh, it can get very serious. I mean, the topics are serious. Like that's at the end of the day, they are, you know, they reflect serious issues that these cultures, not just French culture, but other cultures need to, to, to tackle. But if you present it in a way that is, I don't like the word palatable, but in this case, it's, it, it kind of best reflects the, the purpose. If you have something that people might be able to pick up and feel unintimidated by, you're more likely to get those stories across. And I think you, people want people's stories that they can relate to. And so in some way, even if you don't relate to every single one of the 40 women that I put forward in this book, there may be three or one or four or however many elements to their stories that I think make humanize, first of all, humanize the Parisienne. She's not some you know, aspirational figure. She's not untouchable. She's not unattainable in the way we've been told that she is, um, because obviously these stereotypes are meant for, you know, a slim percentage of the world population. They're not, it's not meant to be attainable by everybody, you know, all these ideals, whether they're beauty ideals or ways of living. And so I think as soon as you can humanize a set of a population and make people see that they're not just some fantasy, you're more likely to get someone to feel something. Okay, what about you? Uh, to me, it was also to to show how that stereotype a stereotype affected real people because it's a myth. It's something that sells that that sells uh, uh, for you know brands, uh, cosmetics, uh, books, but also that affects people because you know when you see Grace, for example, with a magazine saying that she grew up never seeing herself in a magazine, uh, you can everybody can relate to that to how you know uh, it 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 really it really uh, affects your self esteem. It really uh, makes you feel that you like you don't belong, that you like you're not part of the country. Or for example, you have this, those images of the of the subway, the French sub, the, the Parisian subway, um, that are always displayed on every 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 guide um, uh, about Paris. And when you have uh, Elisa Rojas, the lawyer who is um, as, uh, an activist on, uh, on uh, disability, and who says, I've I don't know anything about the, the map of the suburb because I can't access the suburb. That really makes you understand Paris in a different way, even for me, because to me, I've always, uh, I, I've always been kind of proud of my city because it was a city that was, to me, I thought it was accessible because there, there is one, one train station, one metro station at, and, you know, at every, every, every like 200 uh, meters. But, you know, speaking to Elisa makes me see my city in a very different way. And, you know, uh, going on and promoting that idea of Paris really hurts people in, in, in their real life. So actually, you're saying that by making the documentary, it made you interrogate how you've kind of internalized maybe some of these rules. Of course, because, you know, I used to say I love my city because of the servers, because it gets you ev everywhere. But who is you? It's me, because I, I don't I'm not on a, on a wheelchair. Lindsay, did you find yourself also questioning Oh, yeah, your I beliefs mean, that you had. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the the, the amount of time I spent talking to women like Rokaya, like Eliza, but but plenty of others, you're seeing your city in a new way. As soon as someone says something and reveals an injustice that they face every single day of their lives or some sort of an oppression that doesn't affect you personally, you can't you can't unsee that. And so I definitely go through every day of, you know, of my life living in Paris with a much different appreciation or understanding of the city and, and its limitations for a great number of people. It's a, it, it's limiting for me in, in some specific ways, but in very different ways for other people. And I think that's why when you're talking about intersectionality and trying to consider all of the ways that people are living a different experience, uh, and particularly when it comes to women, it's, we're not all going through life in the same way. And so if you're going to develop policies or have discussions that don't consider that everyone is sort of coming to the table with a different lived experience and a different set of potential obstacles or oppressions, then you're not you're not really hearing everybody. You're not you're not considering everyone. Um, Grace, I'd like to go to you because we talked about the visual aspect of the human stories and you have a podcast with Rakaya, uh, Keith, Keith Taras. Tell us about the, the auditory effect of, of storytelling. Yes, we do. We work on a podcast. We have been working together on the podcast for uh, four, four years. And we uh, the podcast is about race in France. So everything race related uh, and uh, each episode we have a guest and the guest will share with us their experience um, living uh, 
in France and uh, facing, uh, you know, uh, be, being a non-white person. And so we, and, and, and the, the podcast, it really helped me demystify, um, you know, myths, uh, you know, such, such as La Parisienne, but I think, I think um, the only way you demyst demystify a myth is uh, through connecting, connecting uh, with people's experience, because, you know, we all know a myth is irrational. It's called a myth. It's not a truth, right? But it's somehow it is working better than facts. If you give, you give us hard facts, they don't compute, but you have a myth, oh, it's so pretty. And yes, and the Parisians are so beautiful, but who are we talking about, right? What is the image? And so th this is something that people will tell us a lot about uh, Paris or living in France. And then uh, pe like people in France, I have a friend who I interviewed for a program uh, about beauty. And she said, oh, when I go abroad, I feel so relieved because I don't have to tuck my tummy in, you know? And I don't have that, I, I don't wanna, I don't have to, to pretend that, you know, all, all these things that we mentioned. So I think the podcast for us has been a way to connect with people's, people's lives, their realities. And that's how we understand, we go past the myth that we, that, you know, we, we, we uh, you know, that, that we keep uh, alive ourselves because we don't, we, we live here and we, we see what everyone sees. So we are immersed in, in this. Thank you. I want to go to Lindsay's point. You you gestured slightly towards policy and law, and that's where I want to go next. Um, and I, I told you I wanted to talk about this because it. I think specifically thinking about the rules that Rakaya sets out in the documentary, be white and be as free as the wind when you go out, so be able-bodied. There is a difference, it seems to me, between discussing the myth, which you all do brilliantly and kind of um, as you say, making it accessible and attractive for people to talk about, and then accounting for the myth at the level of policy and law. So in a, in a country that does not track statistics about ethnicity, in a city, as you mentioned, where access for disabled people is very low, surely the next step for this conversation um, would be for it to reach the level of the state and the court. Have you thought about this, this trying to, to you know, for policy and for laws? folded in at that level? I think it's a really interesting but tough question because if we look to the US as an example, and I'm not saying it's a model, I'm just saying as a, as a, as a counterpoint, um, and, and by myth in this point, we're gonna say representation, right? Because um, these people, the, the myth of the Parisienne would mean that um, you know the people who are represented both in entertainment, so literature and films and, and TV series, but also in leadership roles and in government positions where decisions like policymaking are being made. Um, you can see that there are clear limitations to, to just putting a body in a space and saying we've we've done what we're, you know, we've been told we need to have uh, a, a diversity or a, a diversity of thought and a diversity of voices. And here we've done that. If it's just a curry favor, you're not going to move the dial. Um, and we see that, I mean, there are some examples of really positive agents of change in the US who are people of, of, of color or marginalized individuals, whether you agree fully with her politics or not, AOC, she is someone who is doing something very concrete for her constituents. On the other hand, you have someone like Kamala Harris, who's very important in what she represents and what she says to, or what she shows to, to young children. However, Biden, the Biden administration's selection of her might seem to suggest that having her there, she will be able to influence policy by nature of her race and her gender. But in fact, that's not always the case. Obama himself didn't necessarily do that. He came out and said he wasn't going to be the president of Black America. Um, so you're getting into the situation where if you just think you can you know, have people who are there to change the story or change the myth and show different people occupying these roles and that that's enough, it's not. And I think that's where France is struggling now as well. I mean, look at even the UK with Liz Truss's government, I mean, the cabinet, and you see that it's, you have to start looking at the way class plays into this as well. And no one is really prepared to do that. Um, I know you and I have talked about some of the the cultural uh, pieces of entertainment that have come out of France recently, like Drôle, the, the, the comedy on Netflix that was recently canceled, unfortunately. And the best parts of it, as you said, were 
were the sort of stand-up scenes that had comedians of color who influenced the the script and and the the shaping of the story. Uh, but everybody else involved in the show was white. Um, and I think that if you're if you're not putting a diversity of thought and 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 of background into decisions, whether it's in the you know creative direction of a film or with policy, then you're really not doing anything of lasting value. And I think France has been still stuck on this idea of, well, we're going to put different people on magazine covers and then will you shut up? Isn't that enough? No. And so when you're talking about influencing policy, I think you have to first look at who's even in the in the room versus having policy to actually tackle these things. Rakai, what would for you be the next the next step? Just to acknowledge the issue, for example, to, to start. <laughs> Because uh, I think that there is a, a high level of uh, denial regarding uh, race or gender in France. Like uh, you mentioned the fact that we couldn't uh, track uh, data related to race. So it's possible uh, to do so, but you cannot connect one's uh, identity, the, the identity of an, indi an individual with a race. So it's not possible, for example, to mention race in a census. And I can understand why, because uh, of the history of the Second World War, War, and we know how in France the government can use and compile those type of data to deport and to uh, to massacre basically a whole part of the population. So there is a national trauma that I understand, but at the same time, the fact that uh, the, the National Assembly has, has tried to, to erase the word race, race from the constitution like as if it was magical, so you, you erase race, there is no more racism. It's, it tells a lot about, you know, what you were saying, like you put people, you know, in the picture or you erase the word and there is no, 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 no problem and that doesn't work. So I think that we need, we don't only, we do not only need people uh, who just represent, but people who think of ways, actual way, concrete ways to change and to transform. Grace, for you, next, next step. Um, yeah, I think we already have uh, laws and uh, public policies in place that they make uh, discrimination illegal. I think that's already in the books. So, but what we really need to do is, you know, enforce these laws and and make them, um, you know, uh, yeah, make them um, accessible for 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 the population that is uh, facing these discriminations. And I think that this is still a fight. And I, um, I guess. Uh, what what a lot of people what are we what we are trying to do with the podcast is also to um, have conversations um, uh, about race because I think as as okay I said there's a lot of denial and every time somebody speaks up we we we, we say oh we don't we, we don't want to be repentant and we don't want to erase our history and we don't have to be ashamed of our past I think that's not the point we don't want anybody to feel guilty because if you feel guilty then no one's responsible and I think that that's where the conversation is I think now in Europe in many places is we are there is some kind of um, a binary. Um, people are, and, and it makes people very aggressive ab ab about this issue. And that's, you know, so so this is, I think this is the the where we are now. And so we have to go past this binary of or for or against. It's not just a for or against. It's 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 much more nuanced. But you know, we we don't have room for 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 for, for nuance when it's only on TV and on on the radio and we have debates about. It, 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 this is something that needs to be really, um, you know, on, on, a, on a mass scale. Uh, and then you run into the problem in France, where as soon as you do get together in, you know, disc and have these discussions, you're called a communautariste, because you've now come together as a collective, and you're not supposed to do that, according to, you know. But it, it evolves each, each year, so it was communautariste, and islamo-gauchiste, right. and now wokeist. Oh, right, now, <laughs> now it's, it's the anti war grade. Yeah, yeah okay. and we're all separatists now, yeah. Hey, you've all been called wokeist? In your, have you all been called workers in your work? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's a badge of honor. <laughs> Well, that's that, and I think that's actually what unites the the current struggle, uh, whether it's in France, the U.S., or the U.K., is that we're up against people who are just, you know, finger pointing and saying, "Well, you're woke, so of course you think that." We can't have any so we can't have any discussion of any value until we stop doing that. 
this is interesting say we're, we're talking about the US and there was a there was an article in the New York Times so this was after the murder of George Floyd in July of 2020 so you all remember this summer um, there was the murder there were huge protests across America and then there were kind of ripple protests in France and the UK and many other countries um, and so the the title of the article in the New York Times was a racial awakening in France Rakai you spoke to the journalists and we learned from the article that you visited, thanks to a US government program, you visited America in 2010 to learn about, I quote, managing ethnic diversity in the US. And so Lindsay um, kind of joked about, can we look to the US as a model? And this does beg the question um, because another um, kind of famous speaker about this issue is, is cited in the, in the article, so Mabula um, Sumohoro, talks about racism in America and racism in France. And she says, I'm not saying that one country is better than the other. For me, they're two racist societies that manage their racism in their own way. It's true that France often looks to America for questions about race, but given that the US has a totally different historical, cultural, social background, what are the limits of looking to the US for help? Um, yeah, that's interesting because I think that uh, because of that trip, I'm accused of importing the U.S. model in France. <laughs> like it's it's a label I can I can't get rid of. Ever since I go to the U.S., people think I just got to be brainwashed and to come back to France to just destroy the French Republic and uh, the French laicite. And so that's that's uh, interesting because you have so many people who accuse us of just uh, trying to 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 uh, copy and paste what's going on in the US. And what we are trying to do with our podcast is just to focus on France. So having uh, mostly like only, uh, you know, French scholars or activists or artists, and just to refer to, refer to the, 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 the French intellectuals, because the fact of saying that we look up to the US is also a way to erase the fact that we do have a history of race. Like uh, France, uh, France Fanon, for example, is very influential among the, 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 the American, uh, the African American community. And France Fanon was born in Martinique and he, he died as an Algerian citizen uh, when Algeria um, became independent. So it's, but it's someone who is not really celebrated in France and is mostly celebrated by communities uh, oppressed around the world, but out of France. And uh, that's interesting for us to just remind friends that we have had uh, intellectuals of, of color for a long time and we need to make them be known. For example, my first documentary was about uh, the, the, like the, it was uh, in 2013. So it was the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington and also the 30th of, uh, anniversary of a march that happened, uh, happened in France that nobody knows about. It's uh, La Marche pour l'égalité et contre le racisme. So the March of equal for Equality and Against Racism that took place in 1983. And like every single French person knows about Martin Luther King knows about the I have a dream speech and the March on Washington. And you can go to the street and, and ask about the March uh, for Equality, which was just 40 years ago. Nobody knows about it. Nobody can name Tumi Jaija, who was, who was the one who started the March. And weren't so, there like 100,000 people who attended? There were much more, in proportion, much more people than, the, than in the March on Washington. The, so they started, uh, there were 12 in Marseille. And by the time they went to Paris, so it was a two month March, there were uh, 100,000. And they, they, were, they were actually hosted by the French president, François Mitterrand. So it was a huge moment, but that was erased. So the fact that, you know, if we, for example, in Paris, we, if there is a new train station, that the institutions want to name after someone who is uh, notorious for uh, having been against racism, they will pick Rosa, uh, Rosa, Rosa Parks, you know, in the 19th I never, Yeah, I mean, can you... Like, no, Rosa, like I, I really admire her, but right, we but have some Black women right, who right. do things, you know... It's like the France, most like, obvious deflection of their own history. It's like, what, there's nothing to see here. Yes. Like, the U.S., like, yes, <laughs> let's have her. I mean, it's... And even 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 if if we speak about you know territory uh, the territory the French territory we are also an American territory like Martinique Guadeloupe are French departments who are in America so we are not that far from that continent because those territories were built uh, on the backs of people who were uh, you know indigenous people who were killed but also on the backs of people who were deported from Africa to be enslaved and not knowing the fact that France is the only country who 
which is present on four continents. And it's not because it's open-minded, it's because it was a colonial power. <laughs> so it's like just denying the fact that we are built out of that history. <laughs> this, is such, this is such a great point and it's such an interesting point. Um, Lindsay, Lindsay used this phrase, move the dial. Um, and you kind of use this phrase at the end of the documentary when you talk about the rise of social media as a way to kind of break the myth. Um, because you're saying the rise of social media as a kind of alternative or as um, important way of seeing people's lives and the people who are posting was was one of the one of the factors that helped kind of push this myth forward. For all of you, what were some other um, move the dial to use your phrase moments? Um, maybe recently in the last couple of years. Oh my gosh. I mean, I think there's interesting Apart from your book, of course. <laughs> right. No, but I think there are interesting things being done with uh, artistic exhibits. Um, I think, you know, there's one that just opened now at the Carnavalier Museum on Parisienne Citoyenne, and it only goes up until the year 2000, but it does tell you um, sort of how long this fight has been. It shows you the limitations of, you know, the women's emancipation, emancipation movement, who it left out, uh, when women of color started having their own you know, presence and influence in this discussion around the 80s and 90s and then leading up to this. So there are other ways where you can seek out this information and in other types of stories, but you have to do that. I think if we're going to wait for Netflix to show us something that's, you know, perfectly representative, you're going to be waiting a really long time. But there are thinkers and writers and creatives on all sorts of platforms who are already doing that. But you have to be sort of someone who's going to seek that out. You have to move your own dial. <laughs> right. <laughs> I will uh, talk about uh, East Asian and Southeast Asian representation uh, in in Europe and in the world. I think uh, ever since the 2010s and uh, to now 2020s, I think there has been uh, um, many more um, uh, in in fashion in the fa on the fashion scene. There's a lot of uh, more representation of East uh, Asian women and Southeast Asian women. For example, in the US and also in, in Europe on a lesser scale, there, there has been so, what they call the rise of the uh, elite bloggers, this fashion elite bloggers uh, who are now sitting front row of uh, cat, like all the fashion shows in, 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 um, uh, in in Paris, uh, La, uh, Fashion Week Paris. It, even last week, when there was uh, La, La Fashion Week, there was a uh, Lisa, who's um, the uh, the front one of the front singers of uh, the Korean uh, band uh, Blackpink, who was sitting front row in many many um, uh, br like uh, fashion brands. And people think of this as a really you know a step forward in representation, which is true. And I think when I was um, my children's age, I didn't see a model who, who, who had my face, not in, not in that way, not, you know, um, you know, um, such so she's a queen right now. She sells, so they invite her and they, and, and, and she brings that, that crowd that they, you know, that they don't touch that, they, you know, they're not accessible for these brands and now they, they have her. So it, it she, she's huge, but also, um, this representation, um, will also, we have to think of it as um, somehow enhancing racial class um, and a lot of uh, oppressive stereotypes that are already here. Uh, it, and and, and um, so I, I, it's, 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 you know, how representation has its limits. And if it's just, a, you know, a display window, it's not gonna um, move the dial. It's just gonna be, you know, another way of, you know, another rearrangement of marketing um, directives. And, you know, and, and if you think of, uh, um, you know, Lisa, so she's from Blackpink and in France, everything related to um, uh, Korea in terms of music is placed in a very racial uh, category, which is called K-pop. They can sing R&B, they can be, you know, doing uh, some rap, they can do, you know, whatever kind of music, it will be called K-pop. And so and that's really, you know, it, it, it really strikes me. It's, it's not really, it's not musical genre. It's just a racial bag where you put people because they come from there. So yeah, so this is not help, really helping. 
So this is a really good point, and this gets to my last question before we show the clip, which is that, of course, the Parisienne is mystified and put on a pedestal, but so are women in other cultures, surely. So, you know, you're from the East Coast and you haven't lived there for a while. <laughs> I don't um, know if Philadelphians are put on a pedestal, but I'll, I'm, I'll follow your lead. <laughs> That there are pre there are certainly different pressures that American women face, and there are certainly different pressures that women from China or Cambodia, from an Asian background, face. Can you talk about how, yes, this is particularly per pernicious and exported in Paris and in France, but maybe how you've seen it elsewhere in other cultures? Well, I just think that um, the reason this myth has been so successful to an American audience is because they're constantly meant to feel like they're not doing anything right. And the narrative around French women and, and the French doing everything right, whether it's the way they raise their children to the way that they prepare a meal or you know put on a scarf. I mean, when you do that for generations and you sell that in books, right? You know, French women don't get fat. We all remember that horror. Um, but that does a lot of damage, but also conditions people to say, oh, I haven't read that book, but I think the French do that thing better. And so they're always putting themselves in opposition to some other type of woman who does it magically better. And I think the the reason it works also and the and and the reason that sometimes Americans are sort of targeted with these kinds of brands or stories is because it taps into this deep deep insecurity and lack of confidence. Um and that's how you, you know, can sell lots of products. So what you're saying is that that brands are you if I understand you correctly, brands are using French prejudices to target American prejudices, <laughs> and both are both are both I mean, are myths. At, at the end of the day, women are are just meant to constantly. I mean, whether we're talking about Italian women or Brazilian women or whatever. I mean, there's there's there are some things that unite us in the way that we're meant to feel like garbage. Um, as women and, you know, not meeting a certain standard. And that standard might vary depending on the culture and the society, but it ultimately revolves around never being good enough. And I think, yeah, when you take a culture like France and, and all of these stories that have been exported and, and you know, with, you know, millions of dollars behind them, that can really target, you know, insecurities in women in other countries who are going to say, well, if I'm just a little more French, or a little bit more Parisian, I'll I'll be okay. Grace, can you give us um, maybe from from your your mother, your grandmother, your your family in in Cambodia and China? Um, uh, it's been a long time that uh, you know I went to Asia because of uh, the pandemic, but I I, I know that you know um, uh, the the ideal of the white woman uh, in general, but the French woman in particular is very strong. And uh, you know, for example, you, you know there there is a very um, uh, there is a mystery about how, you know, uh, maybe uh, Mylène Farmer uh, is still very big in Japan or, you know, um, or um, Jean-Paul Belmondo or, you know, these figures of, you know, for French people are, are, are quite, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't say, you know, from the past, but, you know, like they, they don't, you know, well, the, the young people don't know who they are, right? But they, they, they sell lots of things in, 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 I think Cambodia, I think um, um, Alain Delon has a cigarette brand, you know? And so, and I thought, hmm, that's weird because he doesn't do that where he lives. You know, it's, and, and so he would come and sell cigarettes to other people and that's, that's not right. Okay. And so, and also I think we all, we, we, we can, we can um, uh, say about, you know, cosmetics, uh, the, the, the whitenings, the whitening products have, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, they're very popular in many, on many continents in, uh, in Africa in Asia, in South America and many places we try to, 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 to hurt, you know, uh, our, our skins and and our hair and everything you know our bodies just to look like um, someone who is far away and that we have never met sometimes and that is also very harmful for for our health and um, so yeah I, I think all this all this um, is, is 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 it come at play and I think when I come in uh, I, and I also really dislike you know um, the Fr the French have a, a word it's called Eurasian for kids of mixed race so um, they call it Eurasian les enfants Eurasian so it's uh, 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 and I think because um, we don't use the word race right in France so they don't say uh, of of uh, interracial in French they wouldn't say that they say Eurasian but it's exactly what it means 
and and I and I think it's really it's it, it's really um, it's also a word that we need to change in our in, in our vocabulary because if I marry if tomorrow I, I marry a Chinese person from you know who 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 who, who lives in China it is a mixed you know it's a, a cultural like culturally mixed uh, marriage but it, we it doesn't look like it because of of you know of um, of of me how I look so and and see so we have to go beyond all these. Um, these uh, the, the, these labels that we have, the history has has put uh, uh, with us, and yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Can we have a big round of applause, please? So we're we're just going to watch um, if it, we can get it to work, and if not, I'm sure you have a million questions. Yes. Oh, fantastic. We just, I wanted to, to show you um, the first five minutes of this fantastic documentary that inspired this conversation this evening. Rares sont les villes que l'on mythifie autant que Paris. Ville Lumière est première destination touristique mondiale. La figure de la Parisienne est devenue l'étendard de l'identité française. La française idéale véritable icône de la France telle qu'elle est fantasmée. Et si l'on demande ce qu'est une Parisienne, il y a de fortes chances qu'une série de clichés fasse office de réponse. Quand on parle de la Parisienne, on va imaginer la femme longiligne, blanche, blonde, les yeux bleus, enfin, cassée sur son canapé avec son verre de vin, <rire> qui mange bio, qui ne traîne que dans les quartiers chics de Paris, les femmes de verre de thé, qui mange des croissants, sans soutien-gorge au bord de la Seine. Plutôt bobo, qui est à la fois euh, hyper branché, mais pas bling bling. Une femme impressionnante, euh, qui euh, n'a peur de rien. Euh... Ne pas en faire trop, et d'être beaucoup en même temps. Sexually curious than anybody else. Qui fume, un petit peu nonchalante. Euh, <laughs> petit côté un petit peu androgyne, mais pas trop. <laughs> She is almost always straight. Sportive, mais sans avoir l'air non plus d'un boxeur. Able-bodied. Et tu fais du yoga, bien sûr. <laughs> C'est un espèce de cyborg qui ne grossit jamais, qui ne vieillit pas, qui continue d'avoir une vie sexuelle palpitante. J'ai quand même l'impression d'avoir euh, les défauts de la parisienne. <laughs> pas super fréquent. Quand français, on isole euh, un nom féminin et que ça veut dire quelque chose. La Parisienne, c'est vraiment une figure publicitaire euh, quasiment dès son origine. Je m'appelle Rokaya Diallo, je suis née et j'ai grandi à Paris. Lorsque je tape Parisienne sur un moteur de recherche, une succession d'images présente la même vision stéréotypée. Un défilé de femmes dans les profils et les silhouettes quasi identiques semblent se multiplier à l'infini. J'ai beau chercher, je ne vois personne qui me ressemble. Mais qui décide de définir la véritable Parisienne Est-ce qu'il y aurait un guide officiel Si c'est le cas, quelles sont les règles qui permettent de recevoir ce titre tant envié de Parisienne Pour m'accompagner dans mes interrogations, j'ai décidé de recourir à l'expertise de trois autrices. Lunset Tramuta, journaliste américaine, Alice Pfeiffer, journaliste franco-britannique, et Emmanuel Rotaillot, historienne. Et bien sûr, j'irai à la rencontre de ces fameuses parisiennes. Si je me fie à ce que j'ai vu, une chose saute aux yeux. La parisienne devrait posséder une couleur de peau bien particulière. On pourrait donc considérer qu'il s'agit de la première règle du guide de la parfaite parisienne. Avec le numéro 1, soyez blanche. En grandissant en France, moi, j'étais très sensible à la représentation. J'ai très vite euh, trouvé que je ne ressemblais pas du tout euh, aux personnages des livres que je lisais, aux films que je regardais. Pendant longtemps, je ne me trouvais pas jolie ou je ne me trouvais pas aussi jolie que justement ces parisiennes que je voyais et qui incarnaient la beauté à la française. Le fait de ne pas ressembler aux personnages préférés de mes histoires, moi, ça m'a affecté. J'avais l'impression que peut-être je n'étais pas digne d'intérêt, que peut-être je ne pouvais pas 
à être au centre d'une histoire. En tout cas, tout ça, ça me travaillait beaucoup. Et je pense que ça a pesé sur mon estime de moi-même et aussi euh, ma relation avec euh, les autres. Pour commencer, je retrouve mon amie Grace Lee. Écrivaine et autrice de podcast, elle mène depuis longtemps une réflexion sur la représentation des minorités. Alors ça, c'est ma marque préférée de ravioli, ça. Ça, c'est mignon, ça, non ouais, J'imagine pour l'apéro, c'est hyper mignon, ouais, ça. Ouais, c'est classe. Cet immense supermarché s'appelle Tank Frères. À Paris, c'est le lieu d'achat incontournable des produits d'alimentation asiatique. C'est vrai que Tank Frères, pour moi, c'est toute mon enfance. Euh... Mes parents habitaient en province au début et ils disaient tout le temps, euh... on monte à Paris. Ouais. Tu sais et moi, je croyais que Paris, c'était sur une montagne. <rire> Je voyais au haut de la montagne, il y avait tant de frères. C'était la source de la Chine pour moi et pour ma famille. Moi, je suis française et j'ai beaucoup reçu l'héritage asiatique, chinois, cambodgien de mes parents à travers la nourriture. Évidemment, depuis que j'habite à Paris, je me rends compte que ce n'est pas vraiment ça à Paris. Ce n'est pas forcément que le 13e, euh, qui est le quartier où les Asiatiques se sont euh, installés dans les années 70, après cette vague d'immigration euh, dite des de people, il y a eu beaucoup de personnes d'origine chinoise, euh, cambodgienne, laotienne, euh, qui se sont installées euh, ici dans le quartier. Moi, c'était mon pari à moi. La France a été présente pendant 90 ans au Cambodge. Ce n'est pas rien. Et pourtant, cette histoire-là, je ne la retrouve pas dans les rues de Paris. Je ne la retrouve pas dans... Dans, dans le Paris d'aujourd'hui. On a l'impression que ça y est, c'est fini, on est parti, maintenant vous vous démerdez. Ouais. Mais non, <rire> non. <rire> non rentrez chez vous. <rire> Mais non, en fait. <rire> La France a perdu ses... Thank you. Can we have a big round of applause, please? So that's just that's just a brief clip of what is truly such a fantastic documentary. It's funny and it's profound and it's really intelligent. So I'd really recommend for all of you to go out and watch it. We have some time for questions. Are there any questions in the room? Yes. Hi, hi. Thank you so much. I, I can't wait to watch the documentary and read your book. Um, it, it's I've, it's really absolutely opened my eyes, and I'm coming to it as obviously a, you know a straight American who had the privilege of growing up in the states and coming here and. I still have a question, which is, is there anything to salvage? So when we American women and a lot of us who made the choice to come to France and felt as women that we were privileged to live here, and I'm in the same bourgeois limited upper middle class environment, and that's my only basis for comparison, but we come here and at least my generation, we say there are things that women have in France that they don't have in the United States. And I know it's ableist and it absolutely it's not something I think about and I appreciate you bringing that up, but They have health care. They have easier abortion rights. They have education that's affordable. They have actual holidays. They have reasonable working hours. So we as American women say, yes, obviously the sort of slutty image of the French woman buying Chanel, that's not something we need to buy into. But is there something that French women can teach American women from those five Parisian myths, whether you're of color or in the suburbs or wealthy or, or poor. And so I'm just bringing it to like the level of the colonizers, basically. Thank you so much for your for your questions, uh, for your question and your, your comment. I think that the social wave welfare in, in France is something that is very precious to our identity, our identity, and it's something that came out of uh, of the, the 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 end of the Second World War after the Conseil de la Résistance. It was a moment when when France decided decided to support uh, the most uh, fragile parts of the population by with the, la sécurité sociale, social security, but also uh, a whole set of rules that would be that would help more uh, help bring more equality and i think that if there is something to salvage from from that is our, our motto liberté égalité maybe you know move from fraternité to adelphité which is much more inclusive uh, but i think that that what france stands for actually theoretically is beautiful and i think that we should focus more on what's in written in books that than about what is sold actually I have a quick question. You speak about your podcast. You talked about podcast. How can we find the podcast? Remember it? 
Is it uh, uh, Rokaya who does? Is it uh, Grace Lee? Et comment les gens trouvent le postcard? Where can they find it on YouTube? I have just looked. I want to know more. Thank and you so much for your interest for our podcast. Combien, combien de fois par semaine vous faites le podcast? <laughs> so, oh, wow. We have a new listener here. <laughs> Thank you. So it's both of us. We created the, the podcast uh, in uh, 2018. So the name of the, the podcast is Kif Taras. So if you type Kif, k i d f e Taras, you, you'll find it. So it's in French. We have uh, 98, uh, 98 episodes. I don't know about like uh, almost 100 episodes. So you have uh, a lot to dig into. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that there are a couple or three episodes in English. So one with uh, two uh, women from the UK, another with two women from the Netherlands and another with another, another from the US. Uh, it's on YouTube also. It's on YouTube. So you can find Kif Taras on, on YouTube. Uh, we we are it's every uh, a couple, every couple of weeks, but we will start again in January. But there, we, there is a new episode that will come in in two weeks, I think, the one that we did in Geneva, yeah, about uh, racism in Switzerland. Ah, so the documentary, it's uh, <laughs> I think if you have uh, TV Cinq Monde, you can find it. So it's TV Cinq Monde, the French, the francophone channel that. Uh, operates uh, all, all around the world. So it's it, that's the reason why it was translated into English, but it's also available, I think, in, in 14 languages. So <laughs> thank you. I, I'm, I'm not sure, <laughs> but I'll try to find the information and to share it on my social media. Uh, hi. Um, so thank you so much for um, it was so, so refreshing and interesting to see those reflections on the Parisians. I have a question for, for you, Hokaya Diallo, about uh, all the multi-layered identities. So you have Parisian, you have French, uh, you have all the other origins, origin, as we say in French. Uh, in my case, I'm from Madagascar, and I, I really love doing that when uh, French white people ask me where I'm actually from, and I say something like Champagne then, which is absolutely not where I come from. But I just really love to see them struggle with that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because I perfectly know where, where I would come from. I'm French Malagasy, but I didn't feel French uh, until I came to France to study and after a couple of years. Um, so it's for me, it's very much solid and I've noticed that it, it's so different for me knowing that I am Malagasy and I'm also French. Um, but I've never really had this like struggle to try to be accepted as being French, which is different from you know, trying to act Parisian because it's cool. So I don't know, the question is, how do you reconcile all of these three multi-layered identities? Thank you, it's a, it's a very inter interesting question because um, you have uh, multiple layers of identity. And to me, I think that the, the, the journey was uh, in, 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 in a reverse way because I was born here and I thought of myself as a French person for a very long time. I grew up in the 19th, so dans le 19th, so it was a very mixed neighborhood. So not being white was not a thing. It was, I was not white. I had many friends who had, who were, you know, whose parents were, uh, came from Asia, from North Africa, from the Caribbean. So it wasn't even an issue not to be white but the more I advanced in my study the less there were people looking like like me and at some point I really started to focus much attention on something that wasn't meaningful to me and people starting to started to ask me where I was from but it, you know in French the question is do venez-vous d'où viens tu so it's not even where you're from is that where do you come from like if you as, as if you actually came and at the beginning I, I didn't understand I was like I'm from Paris I come I come from Paris but and people were like but before and like before I was born, like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, I actually, I had to understand that people didn't see me as a French person because I didn't conceive myself in the same way. And it's the moment I had to, to really uh, say that I was French because to me, it wasn't a question. People make me question that, but I never questioned the fact that I was French. I also want to, um just to comment on uh, this this very interesting uh, question and topic, but I also want to question the vocabulary that we use because when you say how do we reconcile things, it means that there's a problem to start with, and I think that's also part of the problem with identities that we have been you know dealing with this for a long time is the people always ask you but how do you do it, 
how do we do what? Okay, there's no, there's no, there's nothing wrong in the first place. You know, there's nothing, there's no opposition between being Asian or Magalasi um, uh, or Black French, you know, and there's nothing to, there's no, you know, there, yeah, there's nothing to reconcile. And I think that's, that's where, um, and, you know, it, it's like as if there's a choice to make, you know, that people always ask you, oh, do you, or do you feel more French or more Asian? I don't know, because there is no statistics, you know, in my body. And I just, I feel very French when I'm, you know, in, in a part of the world where they sell cheese, very expensive and, and very bad cheese. And I feel so French when I see that and so I get so angry, right? And then at other times I will feel, you know, I will feel more Asian or my heritage will, will, will speak for me. So I think, you know, and, and yeah, so I think we have to also think of the words that we use when we talk about who we are, because it will, and, and I also think that the, the, the layer thing for identity, I'm not sure about also the layering because there's always a covering, you know, there's like a top coat and a base coat. <laughs> and I don't know, I, I'm not sure. I think we, we're making this up as we, you know, as we go and um, we, ha we need to have a conversation about those words. Well, it's just like challenging our ideas of, you know, why we believe so heavily into myths, we have to challenge, you know, our way of framing when we're talking about ourselves, essentially. Hi, uh, what a brilliant conversation. Uh, this is wonderful. Um, so I'm a mother of two of those uh, Eurasian uh, babies. Um, and I'm reminded each time, even from my own in-laws that uh, these are perfect. These are like the, the best of two worlds. Uh, they're beautiful, they're gorgeous. And also they put their faith on my children who are half Asian and half uh, French, white, uh, that they're gonna take us to the next level and be post-race. Um, we're gonna leapfrog you know, all of the, the disasters that the US is dealing with with race and just leapfrog into being universal, non-race, post-race. Um, how do you all feel about that? Because I, I, I'm a, a loss of words. That. Isn't that what what we were told was going to happen by having Obama as president? We know how that ended up. It's it's just not a thing. I mean, and how can you be post race when you haven't even dealt with anything yet? I guess that's my. I mean, I guess you could just appease them by saying yes, that would be nice. But I don't think I, I feel like that's that's an a utopia that is so far out of reach. Yes, and it's uh, as, as well as you have the word uh, Eurasian, you also have the word Métissage in French that is, uh, you know, that, that really focuses, focuses much fascination, like as if it was the, 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 um, the solution to all the, the race problem, problems that we, that we have. And we can tell uh, by just watching, looking at our, our history, that is not the truth. Like, for example, if we take the Caribbean island, they were the, 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 the part of France that which, uh, in, on which there is the most mixing, but the mixing was not made for good. It was meant to, it was made to enslave, to produce more people who, who were uh, enslaved bodies. So by itself, mixing doesn't make anything. Like you can be mixed in order to perpetuate white supremacy, but you also can also just be uh, mixed because uh, you live in a space that allows people to, to go through the racial barriers. But you know, thinking that metis the metissage will solve everything by itself is just a myth. Like it's the myth of the 80s um, SOS racism that was uh, saying like, yeah, it's, uh, you know, if we go all together, we will defy racism. That doesn't, that doesn't work like that. <laughs> so it's a way to deflect our political problems to, you know, moral problems. You know, all we need is love. And then, you know, problems would just solve themselves, right? And I think that's when you have kids, you really think you, you really think, you know, it, this question really becomes really important because I also have children who are who go to school and at school presently, they face the same problems that I did when I was their age. And I actually think they, 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 they have they're facing worse than what I did because they they have gone through the pandemic. You know, like, um, like classmates have been called Corona. And people did not want to sit by them in class. And so this is a step further than it is a rejection that I didn't know when I was smaller. And, and I think so I think it's being it's, it's getting worse, right. And uh, so I don't, we cannot buy into 30 years. I've been here 30 years. Uh, my, my, that nothing happened and it's even worse. So I can't, you know, I, I can't be just sitting here and be like, oh, my kids, kids, it will be all fine, because I know it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to come on its own.
Thank you for this discussion and your work. Uh, you guys have mentioned, when we look at this Parisian definition, it makes me think of definition versus connotation. It also immediately takes me to systematic versus cultural oppression. How much of this is systematic oppression? How much of this is us as a society needing a new adoption journey and an and anthropology journey adventure that we get to stretch into? Um, and then I guess my the part C of that question then is what generation gets to um, redefine this Parisian woman? I, I'm not sure to be able to answer to the, the whole question, but there is one part that uh, uh, I can quote from Nathalie Garçon, who is one of the, uh, of the women that I interviewed in the documentary. She's a designer. She told me, for example, that the younger generation were, were not as slim as their parents. And I think that, and she was, she was um, citing the influence of hip hop artists. The fact that, you know, having uh, more uh, curvy women uh, on social media, on, you know, on video clips, really changed the perception of that younger generation who is, you know, much more connected to the world. So it's not a major change, but to me, it's also, um, you know, it, it tells a lot about, you know, how that, that very, restrictive image of the Parisian uh, woman was also, uh, you know, um, was was uh, operating because there wasn't Beyonce at that time, you see, there wasn't Nicki Minaj, and you have a younger generation who tends to think that maybe it's not as good as uh, as it used to be uh, perceived to be that slim. And of course, there are other, other, other forms of pressure. That doesn't mean that uh, the pressure has um, disappeared, but it's an evolution. And it's really a challenge to that image of the very skinny woman that, is, that was centered as the standard of beauty. Uh, I will try to, to cover the first part. <laughs> um, I th there's a lot of talk about uh, the word systemic racism right now. Um, so systemic means that it's a system. The, the problem is systemic means that it's it's on every level of society and that but it doesn't uh, equate with systematic. Systematic means that it happens every time, right? If you're systematically late, it means you're late whatever, you know, what whatever the time is, you're going to be late. Um, and so and so like for, for, if I talk about racism, ra if racism is systemic, it means it's embedded in our in, in how our society was was built. But it's not systematic, is it? In in the way that you know, I, I can face racism today in the metro if I go out there, but maybe not tomorrow. And so, but what what it means is that if something it, is that um, racism will put me in a category that is a, a subhumanity. In, in some, you know, if I'm not as human, you know, I'm not a human person like any other, uh, every other person, every other white person, which means that, you know, something happens at the other side of the world, such as a pandemic, and I will be scapegoated for it. Um, and so that's, that's what like, racism would, like, and systematic means is that um, yellow peril or, you know, all these theories that were uh, uh, built uh, made up in, in in previous centuries, they are still somewhere around us, you know, in our books, in 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 our cultural, um, in everything. Yeah, or what we consume, and that they will unearth that uh, difference and make it real for me. Uh, so that's what it means. And um, and yeah, yeah, we do need to look into other ways of. Um, we, you, you mentioned the word anthropology. So anthropology for a long time was, you know, studying people, um, the, you know, going far away and, and, and studying people who were different and learning from them and maybe taking things from them. And, and I think, yes, we do need to have another look at this. And, you know, uh, critical white studies, we can't say this in French, they don't have a synonym, but les études de blanchité are, you know, something that we need, we need to look into now because if we're going to change stuff, it's not just you know, change is not upon people who are um, non-white. Uh, it's it's going to be something you know uh, global, and so critical white studies are very uh, are very necessary. Such as you know in in um, in, in in class study in the um, in the uh, Poinçon Charlot, les points Monique, les Poinçon Charlot, who were uh, les sociologues so sociologists. They uh, they were the first 
French uh, sociologist to uh, write about les riches, the rich people, the, the dominant class. And I think we need to be looking at, you know, in, in order to, to, to think of how, you know, how the class is structured, you need to look at all the, all the classes, all the, yeah. So I think, yeah, the critical white studies are very necessary now too. 